This is part two to our lecture on art before history. In part one, we talked about the Stone Age and how it was broken down into the Paleolithic and Neolithic eras. And we've mostly been concentrating on the Paleolithic, particularly in painting. We had talked about the Altamira Cave and how that was the very first cave painting found. We talked about the Lascaux Cave, probably the most famous of all caves, from 1940 to 1994, home of the Hall of Bulls. And finally, the Chevet Cave, which has outstanding cave paintings that look like modern-day artists could have created them. Also a note on the name. In French, it is pronounced Chauvy, and so if you get some recordings or see some video from France, it's the Chauvy Cave. Uh, but in America, we tend to uh, mispronounce those words, and we call it the Chevet Cave. But as we go into the Neolithic era, and something we didn't really bring up in the last video, is what's called rock shelter art. Rather than cave paintings, these are cave paintings that are more exposed to the elements, that are more outside under small protective coverings, rather than deep into the recesses of caves. It's also something we see exclusively in the Neolithic era. And here's an example here from Algeria, although they are found uh, throughout this area of the world, not only in Northern Africa, but again in Southern Europe. But you can see, especially in the lower right-hand side here, uh, how the images themselves are fairly small and definitely exposed to the elements. So let's go ahead and switch and talk about sculpture now. The very first work, in your book it's called Human with a Feline Head, but rarely is it called that. Most of the time it's called Lion Human, and it's really great because it dates back to about 30,000 BC. Now in this class, um, I don't really test you on dates. I'm more concerned with you placing these artworks in their cultural context. But as far as dates go, particularly with prehistory, we have date swings of a thousand years very easily when new technology comes around to help us pinpoint when these were created. So I don't really look at dates too too much in cement during this time period. Um, the later we get in the class, absolutely we have more specific time periods where we can relate these works to. Note that it is made from ivory and a lot of the early sculptures are created from ivory. And as far as prehistoric art goes, it's gigantic. Most of prehistoric art you can hold in your hand. Um, this is about a foot tall. And what's really cool is that the artist had to use the power of imagination. And when we get to the roles of the artist lecture about halfway through this semester, you'll find that this fulfills role number three, which is giving form to the immaterial, something that doesn't exist. So this work is half human and half animal. It was found in a, a cave um, in Germany. However, World War II was raging at the time, and the artwork could not be recovered until after the war. So that's a little fun fact for you. Uh, the next work is equally an icon of prehistoric art, which is the Woman of Wielendorf, and also called uh, the Venus or the Goddess of Wielendorf. Uh, she is neither a Venus nor a goddess. Um, again, she dates back pretty far to about 28,000 BC, and she's named so because she's found in Wielendorf, Austria, uh, back in 1908 she was found, and the limestone she's created from is not limestone that is native to the area. Um, there are some, when she went under microscopic examination, uh, there were particles of red ochre found, so she was painted at one time. Her height is pretty small. Uh, it's about four and a half inches tall, so again, you could hold her in the palm of your hand. And today she sits in the natural 
uh, History Museum in Austria. Another really cool work is The Woman of Brassenpoi, which is only about an inch and a quarter tall. Uh, again, she's made out of ivory. Uh, she has an abstracted face and hair. Um, she's thinner, definitely more athletic looking than The Woman of Wielendorf. And that previous work that we saw, you know, um, a lot of people have said that she could possibly be a, a fertility goddess and that is up for debate. It is interesting, though, that unlike the other sculptures that we find from this time, she doesn't really have a defined face, such as the lion human or the woman of brass and poi. One other work is uh, this one here. And again, the dates are, are pretty far ranging, uh, about a 7,000 year span. Uh, she is made out of ivory also, about six inches tall, and comes from the Rideau Cave in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Uh, again, it's a, a work that we find in the early part of the 20th century. The term I'd like you to learn is sculpture in the round. Now, with sculpture in the round, that just means that the artwork itself is three-dimensional. We can turn it all the way around. It's meant to be viewed from all sides. This is in contrast to what's called relief sculpture. And relief sculpture is meant to be seen only from one side. And it's usually carved into, uh, as we go into the Greek civilization as well as the Romans, these are artworks that are usually carved into a wall. Let's go ahead and move away from sculpture and talk about architecture. Architecture during this time, in fact, throughout the ancient world, is created by the shell system, which means that one basic building material provides both the structural support for the building and its outer covering. Today, we have buildings that are made with what's called the skeleton and skin system, meaning that we have a strong framework, whether it's wood or iron or steel, and then covered by a protective or even ornamental skin, such as uh, plaster or drywall, um, aluminum siding, those would all be uh, considered the skin. So with the shell system, again, we're going to see that throughout the semester. In Paleolithic times, we have mammoth bone houses, and they date back to around 15,000 BC. Uh, the remains of many of these have been found in areas of Russia. Uh, the Space itself is not too large. Um, you can see in this image here, it's roughly 15 feet in diameter, and people wandering would be uh, would build these uh, just kind of like a giant tent. As long as the bones were accessible, these were easily constructed, and then you can kind of see the skin of the animal is used as installation up top. But we see a lot of architecture as we move on to the Neolithic era, such as the settlement at Scarabray, probably the best preserved of all Neolithic sites. And this is located in the Orkney Islands, just off the coast of Scotland. And it's an area that has about seven rooms that are interconnected through passageways. The one uh, room we're interested in seeing is kind of in the upper right-hand corner. I'll show you a zoomed-in shot there. Um, this has two very important construction techniques. One is corbeling, one is post and lintel. And again, we see these throughout the ancient world. Corbeling deals with the edges of this structure, and each set of stones is set slightly inward from the previous. And in this example, this is uh, from one of the Anasazi Indian cliff dwellings that creates a very crude form of art where we have the weight of the building or the structure starting here, instead of it pushing down, it's transmitted down off to the sides and then eventually to the ground. So again, it's a very crude form of arch. And most of the time, these structures would be about 15 to 20 feet in diameter. The very largest corbeling structure we'll look at later in this semester is about 40 or 45 feet. Now, 
Back to Scarabray, we also have this little area here, uh, which would have been like a storage cabinet or what have you. Um, this is made with the post and lintel system. And again, we see that throughout the ancient world and particularly in the Greek temples and such, where we have the posts are vertical, the lintel is horizontal, and each supports the other. Over in Stonehenge, we see this. And we're going to talk about Stonehenge uh, for just a minute or two. It's by far the most famous of the megalithic structures, and it's also the most complex. It is not the largest, though. Keep in mind that this was constructed over a tremendously long length of time, nearly a thousand years, you know, so it wasn't created over a weekend or even uh, a summer vacation. This was a thousand years of creation. We're still not exactly sure why it was built. Um, it could have served, and it, it did serve in uh, different aspects of time as all of these. Astronomical observatory, solar calendar, place for religious rituals, a place for healing the sick, and also a crematorium. What's unique about this structure and what's important for us to remember that the culture here had to quarry, transport, and raise these stones. And if you've never been to this part of England, uh, this is not a dry, flat desert area where it would be fairly easy to move these works. Um, this is marshland, forest, rivers, and it, it's just nearly impossible to think about a time before the wheel where they were able to move these stones. The average stone is 26 tons. The largest one weighs a little bit over 50, and they averaged 16 feet tall. They moved, they were moved 23 miles from the quarry to their current location. So definitely quite an advancement for early man. And we'll take a look at a few pictures as well as some artist renderings of Stonehenge. Another megalithic structure are called dolmens, and they're frequently found in Ireland, but also other areas of the world, primarily in Europe. And these are tombs that were used for single burials. Dolmens themselves, and I'll show you a picture here, are, and this is the most famous one, the Browns Hill Dolmen, where you can see smaller rocks around the base and then what's called a capstone on top. The capstone here is like 150 tons. This would then have been mounded up with soil, sod put on top, and many of these are being uncovered uh, throughout Northern Europe and again up in Ireland. And here's just a few other assorted, uh, assorted dolmens uh, for you to take a look at. And this ends our lecture on prehistoric art. Uh, we'll take a look at our next lecture in a week, uh, which will be on the Middle East.